I was recently asked by one of my viewers if I could do a video on how to interpret the schematic diagram for the range switch on a Simpson 260 VOM. It occurred to me that over the years I've had several requests to describe various things that you can find in a schematic. These multi-wafer, multi-position switches that you find in things like test equipment like multimeters or shortwave receivers or any of the older equipment before everything was all electronically switched are uh, a pretty common request. So today we're going to take a look at these multi-wafer, multi-position switches and how they're represented in the schematic and how to interpret them. Because oftentimes, depending on the piece of equipment, they're drawn or represented in the schematic a little bit differently. So I'll show two examples here of how to interpret these switches. Now I've got a couple of old junk main boards out of some old 260s here to show you the switches we're talking about. This one here is out of an old uh, Series 3, I think. And you'll notice that the main range switch, which is the one that appears in the center, has got one wafer here that's got some contacts and, the, and a center contact that rotates around. And then another wafer down at the bottom with some more contacts. And uh, some of these switches actually have contacts on both sides of the wafer itself. And then the polarity switch, the AC-DC and uh, uh, DC polarity switch is a separate one over here. Now another variant of it, this is uh, I think out of a Series 5. You'll notice that this one doesn't have any wafers on one side, but there's two wafers of the switches on this side here. So there's one wafer down here, another one up here. And again, you can see you know, some of the contacts you know, that can be made on the rotary portion of the switch up here. But there's another one underneath on this side, and another one down on the top of the board over this way. So it could be sometimes, for, you know, for each wafer, you could have two levels of contacts. So two wafers could have four levels of contacts, for example. Some older pieces of equipment, like this very old uh, Hickok uh, Wheatstone bridge that needs restoration here, sometimes they go hog wild with these switches. To take a look at the bottom of this thing, some of these wafers are, let's see, one, two, three, four wafers with switches, you know, and contacts on both sides of them. Three wafers on that one, you know, four here and here. So this thing has got a ton of those. So this schematic, once I find it, is going to be uh, chock full of what those rotary switches look like in a schematic. But let's focus on the Simpson 260 as one of our examples. And the example we'll use for this video is the Simpson 260 uh, Series 6. I was able to get a nice clean schematic of that uh, somewhere online. So this will be a good example of how to read how those switches function in the schematic. Now the first thing to notice is that this range switch has got 12 positions, uh, ranging from the 1000 volt position here all the way around to the R times 10,000 position here. Now on the schematic itself, you'll also see those same 12 positions down the side here. So each of these represents one of those rotary switch positions. Now the range switch, as you can see here, is really represented by essentially these schematic elements. Uh, this set of blocks and rectangles and squares here and here and here, and here. Now in between these large rectangles and the squares and these smaller rectangles here, you can see a double pointed arrow here, and here, and here, and here. Those double pointed arrows represent the movable portions of the switch. So when you're changing the switch position, you're moving where those arrows are making contact. Now we can see from the note down here, that the range switch is in the 500 slash 1000 volt position and we can see that here as well. So first position 1, the 500 thousand volt position, we see the contacts are all sitting up here in position 1. Now the dashed line going up here and then diagonally to each of those indicates that all of these are tied together. Meaning when you rotate the switch, this set of arrows along with all the rest of these are all going to move down. So if I move down to the 250 volt uh, position, this set of arrows would make contact between this common bus bar and that contact. And then this common, then this would move down to here between these two common bus bars. So it would really be no change in, in the function of at this wafer. It's still connecting these two bus bars together. In this switch position, same thing. When I move down to position 2, it's the same as position 1. And then uh, this final one here, we would move from connecting up to this position to connecting this bus bar to this resistor here. 
And this is really the key to understanding the function that's represented in the schematic, is that these long bus bars, if you will, these long rectangles represent essentially a, a common conductor. So as we rotate the switch, we're moving the contact down this conductor. So this is really essentially one end of that switch, or effectively one pole of it. So we've got a single pole, 12 position switch here. Uh, but in this case, you know, that's the common for the pole. But some of the switches will have breaks, like this one, for example, here. I've got a, a common pole at this side, but then I've got, you know, common positions for the first five switch positions here, but then positions six, seven, and eight are on another common bus bar. Nine is isolated by itself, and then 10, 11, and 12, those positions are all going to be a common thing. So you just have to look at what position you're in, move virtually in your mind, move the connection down to that position, like say position six. There would be a short connection here, everything else will be open. A short connection here, a short connection here, and then a short connection in this case, hey, I don't have number six. So that means this switch only has a function during the first five switch positions. From switch positions six through 12, there's no contact at all made on this level of that wafer. So uh, it's essentially is taking out of the circuit and is not doing anything. So again, uh, we have 12 positions on each of these wafers, but in this case, seven of those are not even populated with any kind of conductor or contact material. But we do have it populated for the other three wafers. The other rotary switch on the Simpson 260 is the switch that allows you to select between AC, plus DC, or minus DC. And that is actually these three sets of contacts here. So I could see one, two, three, four movable contacts. And again, the same type of a thing. That's a common bar, a common bar, and a common bar. Then individual contacts for this uh, rotatable contact. Same thing here. And this one has got three on either side. Again, the dotted line indicates that all those move in parallel with each other with the function switch. So the function switch currently is in the plus DC position. So as an example, let's follow the schematic of what the, is going on inside the meter when we set the meter to measure uh, plus DC on the 2.5 volt range. So that's switch position 5 on the range switch. Okay, so I've got my input coming into the plus terminal down here. And that goes up to this common area. And we can see it connects over to this contact, which is doing nothing for us at this point. And to this contact here, which goes up here and splits. This end, we can see, goes out to an open contact, so it's not doing anything, so we could ignore it. The other end of it is going up to this common bar here. Now, we're going to be in switch position 5, so we have a connection from this bus bar to this location here, which connects this to the, directly to R4, and that goes over to here. Uh, in this case, there's also a split. This one comes down to this switch position, which we're not connecting to, so we can ignore that line. And then we've got another contact, again, switch position 5 from there to this common bar. Uh, and then that common bar goes to our meter circuit. Okay, we're actually going to measure current and, uh, and measure that. And then the, the series resistor scales it to the voltage that we want. That comes off to this common bar here. Again, switch position 5 connects that over to this spot. And we can follow this back down. And that goes into this switch through this connection here and then out to the common. So there's our schematic circuit for the 2.5 volt DC measurement position. Now schematics with these multi-wafer, multi-position switches can look confusing and intimidating because of all the connections and all the dead ends, if you will. But at the end of the day, at a given position for the switch, there's only essentially one set of contacts that's made on each wafer. And you just essentially follow that connection and ignore everything else. And uh, you can very simplify that schematic to understand what's going on. So again, there's two examples of these multi-wafer, multi-position rotary switches. This one here with four sets of movable contacts for the AC, plus DC, and minus DC function switch. And then the 12 positions for the range switch. And uh, the interesting thing here again is that for several of those contact positions from 6 through 12, there are no contacts at all on that particular wafer. So we still have four movable wipers, 
but once you get down past this position here for the for the current and resistance measurements this wafer has no effect at the, on the circuit whatsoever. So I hope this helped you to understand this schematic representation of these rotary switches in this case for the Simpson 260. Let's take a look at one more example that represents these types of switches in a little bit of a different format. Now this schematic is a portion of a schematic for a, an old realistic DX160 uh, five band shortwave receiver. It has a number of coupled controls. Um, we've got you know, a main rotary switch which is the band switch which represent, is represented by these circular elements in the schematic here and that's what we're going to focus on. Now again you'll notice the dashed lines connecting each of these up essentially to a common line up here at the top all right and that is for the band switch now there are some other dash lines in here as well in fact these guys here that are going to these variable capacitors or like for the tuning capacitors and the band spread capacitors and there's another dash set of lines that are connecting these potentiometers which are kind of for the RF gain control but we'll ignore those for now and just focus on the multifunction range switch What's interesting about this representation of these switches is that actually the picture kind of looks like the way the switch is built. Uh, the, this is the actual rotary part of the switch that spins around. And uh, the arrows in this case are not movable. Those are actually representative of the contacts. So think of this, these dark rings, either the full rings here or the semicircular rings here, as conductive elements and uh, that is what gets rotated around and again they all get rotated in concert because they're all kind of connected together you know with these dash lines here this is a different representation than what we saw in the 260 where the arrows are the movable part in this case it's these wrote these circular elements that actually move to the different switch positions now the schematics will always show the switches this all these elements of the switches in the same position, meaning that in this case we're in switch position A for band A on the receiver. And we can also see that there's an arrow indicating the rotation direction. So in this case, uh, this when we go from A to B, we're rotating clockwise, but for that same A to B movement, this one rotates counterclockwise. This one clockwise, this one counter, this one counter, and this one counter. So you have to be careful of watching that direction when you're looking at the different switch positions. Now I've zoomed in on just these first two wafers to kind of point out some details to make it easier to see. Now if you look carefully at these arrows, okay, all of these arrows here from B, C, D, and E, they all are not contacting the ring, meaning that in this switch position they're not making any contact at all. They're effectively out of circuit. You notice the length of the arrow for contact A is the same length, but there's a little bit of a tab on this ring that's reaching out and making contact with that with the ring for position A. Now you also notice over here this arrow is contacting the ring. So that is essentially our common connection to this ring. So effectively on this on this particular wafer, as we rotate from A to B to C to D, etc., we're basically making connection from this node here to any one of these particular branches. And in the case of you know, switch 2, wafer number 2 here, we can see that this connection here is connecting to the ring. So that's our common connection. And as we rotate from A to B to C to D, this tab is making contact over here. So we can see if we look carefully that this particular set of switches are selecting which tank circuit we're going to wire in to the front end of this receiver for bands A through E. So these are two very different visually looking representations of similar types of switches. Again, the, the switches shown here in this DX160 schematic really very closely look like what the wafers actually look like themselves. So if you actually look here, we can see this, you know, some rotate, some conductor here and here and here. And when this center element gets rotated around, it's making contact to certain of these contacts here. In fact, you can see some of these are short. Okay, there's a little bit of a tab right here, so this one will rotate around, make contact to this one, to this one, and this one here. And we also see that uh, we've got other contacts that will uh, make contact when this thing rotates around. This thing will eventually grab this guy, which is longer. So it will make contact with this ring for all three of those particular positions once we get over there. 
So to me, this visual representation is more intuitive in terms of what the switch is doing. But uh, for whatever reason, Simpson decided to represent those switches in this kind of linear fashion with these movable bars. And maybe it simplifies the way the rest of the schematic gets put together. I haven't tried drawing it the other way, so I don't know. So I hope this video will help you to better understand how these types of rotary switches that you'll find in equipment such as this Simpson 260 are represented in a schematic and how to interpret what they do. If you like this video, give me a thumbs up. And thanks again, as always, for watching. We'll see you next time.